Okay, let's get started. So, welcome to another episode of the Second Steel Podcast. I'm your host Carl Za, and today we have a very special guest, all the way from China.、Uh, welcome to our show, Mr. Gordon Gao. Thank you, thank you, Carl, and、uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you on your、uh, podcast. Uh, I, I remember we have been talking about this for at least half a year, so finally it's、uh, it's come true. Yeah, I especially like your podcast program because I think you're among the few ones who take Xinjiang issue and take、uh, the Central Asia history seriously. I actually enjoy、uh, some of your podcast,、uh, you know, taking some、uh, very close look at Xinjiang's、uh, history. I think there's a、uh, few ones seriously studying that. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a pleasure to be、uh, on your sh- on your podcast program and、uh, to talk about my experience, my personal experience as a minority ethnic guy grew up in Xinjiang. So、uh, I think before we come to our formal topic, I need to、uh, make a few disclaimers. First, uh, uh, the things I'm talking about are strictly myself, my personal experience. I'm not trying to generalize、uh, my experience to all the people in Xinjiang. There are 25 million. Folks back home, so I'm going to speak for myself. And I think that for any、uh, well-educated people,、uh, they can basically,、uh, when they listen to my stories as a minority ethnic guy, Mongolian minority ethnic、uh, minority ethnic guy growing up in Xinjiang, the things I heard, the things I saw, and the things I experienced, I think it's、uh, it's it's、uh, it's good for themselves to make their own conclusions based on those informations. Ah,、uh, so so yeah, that's that's I think that's the things I need to say.、Uh, that that's、before. um. So maybe let me introduce you. I I met you on Twitter, and immediately I realized you have a very interesting perspective on Xinjiang in particular because you yourself、uh, grew up as an ethnic minority, uh, uh ethnic Mongol in Xinjiang. And and right now, as you know, Xinjiang is in the news, and and there's a lot of Disinformations about Xinjiang, especially in the Western、uh, mainstream media, and I thought it was great to invite you to my show to talk about your own personal experience growing up in Xinjiang as a ethnic minority.、Uh, I mean, because right now we hear people, you know, like white expat、uh, <laughs> and white anthropology professors, George Washington University, talking about Xinjiang, but we. We don't hear too many of like the native Xinjiang voice, so so thank you, thank you for agreeing to do this interview, and、um, maybe maybe you can introduce a little bit about、um, yourself, like if you don't mind, you know, you you can talk about your personal experience growing up in Xinjiang. Uh, back in what eighties, nineties, two thousand, because. Uh, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever you want to talk about, I mean, it's 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 a、uh, it's free. It's it's gonna be like a, uh, it'll be like conversation between you and me, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah,、uh, very good. So I'm trying to、uh, make it very、uh, as interesting as possible because I have a tough day today. You know, no, don't worry. Your 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 story will be interesting because you know we. We don't know. It, it, my most of my、uh, audience are English speaking uh, uh, audience from primarily United States, but other English countries,、uh, speaking country as well, like Australia, Canada, UK, etc. There's such so little information about Xinjiang, you know. So I say any information is good. So so you know whatever you have to say, I'm sure it's. It's quite valuable input. Start to use myself a little bit. So I was、uh, born in Xinjiang,、uh, at the capital Romchi, and I'm half Mongolian, half Han, half Mongolian on my mother's side and half Han on my father's side.、Uh, this mixed family is not uncommon back in Xinjiang, especially in northern part of Xinjiang. So、um, I was when、well, after I was born, I was registered as a Mongolian, which everyone agrees,、uh, because at、um, You know why, actually, because there there's actually、uh, benefits to ethnic groups,、uh, ethnic minority guys、uh, for our kids. Yeah, to be、uh, to be Mongolian, you know, to be able to take advantage of the, the ethnic minority policies in China. And but first of all, 
the existence, as I mentioned with Dan, the existence of myself is the result of China's ethnic minority policy. In, uh, I was born in 80, uh, 86. So uh, back to the, uh, I think throughout the 80s and most of the times in the 90s, uh, that was the time that China's uh, single one, uh, one child policy was the strictest. So uh, that means that if you are Han Fan Lei and if you are, uh, you know, uh, give birth to one, more than one child, uh, that would be disastrous for your family. If you're working for a publicly owned company or something, a state owned company or a government or a military, uh, you'll be fine immediately. So uh, lucky thing is that- uh, So uh, let me interject for a second because yeah, I am 10 yeah, years yeah. older than you. So I, I okay. also have a personal anecdotal story about the one child yeah. policy because I was- okay. born yeah, I was born in 1976. Uh, the, the time I was born, China just started yeah, the one child policy. And it was kind of yeah. rolled out in different regions, different cities. Mm -hmm. And at that time, my my mom was from Chongqing. Chongqing is where oh, okay. I was born. And yeah. uh, in but she and her my dad, they both work in the Tibetan area of Sichuan because they were sent down during Cultural Revolution as part of the um, educated youth. Uh, my dad yeah. was an engineer and my mom was a nurse. And right. the policy back then was in, in big cities like Chongqing, the Han, uh, Han families can only have one child. That's one child yeah. policy. But yeah. uh, that back then, the, the, the one child policy didn't apply to ethnic uh, minority regions yet. Yeah. You know, it didn't apply to the different because, areas. Yeah. Uh, and also for the for the, the those Han people that was were sent to the frontier region that were sent to like ethnic minority uh, areas like during Cultural Revolution like my parents they were allowed to have two yeah. kids yeah. they were allowed to have oh, two yeah, kids. Yeah. so I was legal I was <laughs> I was legally born but but yeah, yeah. my my uh, huko or my resident permit will be tied. Uh -huh to the Tibetan area. So my, my, my resident permit was, would be uh, tied to Kangding uh, in uh, Gansu, Gansu uh, Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. Uh, but my, even though my mom came back to Chongqing to give birth to me, uh, and, and she actually ran into problems because uh, the first hospital she went to, they were like a model, uh, they were like model hospital for implementing uh, one child policy. Yeah, yeah. So, so the hospital director is like, no, 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 we can't take you. You know, like if you take you, that's gonna break our record of implementing the one child policy. My mom's like, but yeah. wait, wait, wait. You know, the policy said uh, because I work in the Tibetan areas, I'm allowed yeah. to have two yeah. two children. And yeah. the director said, what do you mean? That's not Gansu is not part of China. <laughs> because she, she didn't understand the the one child policy is different like across regions. So my mom has actually had to go to a second hospital in order to give birth to me. And then uh, my grandma had to pull a lot of personal connections in order to change my uh, resident permit from Gansu Tibetan Autonomous mm -hmm. Prefecture to yeah. Chongqing, where I was born. So that, but in 1976, uh, so I was born in 1976. I went to uh, elementary school in 1982. And I remember my class, I was only one with, with a sibling. I only, me have an older sister, the rest of them all. Awesome here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so, so okay, yeah, so back yeah. to you, <laughs> back to your story. Right, right. Oh, interesting story. I, I really enjoy that. And I also realized that the one child policy is, uh, is applied differently across regions and to different groups of people. For example, your uh, mother was uh, uh, one of the Jibian Qingyan or Jibian Ganbu. So, uh, because he uh, actually suffered a lot working far away from home in those frontier areas with harsh conditions. So, special policy applies to them as well. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's very good to know because uh, for my family, only because my mom uh, is my ruling ethnicity. So uh, the special policy of uh, allowing two child applied to, uh, applying to our family. I mean, I'm only talking about the urban area. In Wuya, in Nanjiang, in the southern part of Xinjiang, always have 
you know, five or six you know, children, so it's a very big family. I remember the, I think the policy was uh, kind of changed from year to year. It was two yeah, for yeah. the urban families and three for the rural families. But in Xinjiang, it's not really enforced, <laughs> especially in rural areas. Oh, yeah. The chairman of, uh, chairwoman of the uh, Uyghur World Congress, uh, Rub- uh, uh, Rubia Kadir, right she has like five kids she has five kids right but so obviously the one child policy didn't apply to her i mean or, or most of the uyghur families didn't get affected yeah yeah uh very good point i mean back to the 80s and 90s especially in the rural area nobody cares that and no one seriously applied the one child policy to the rural area because the uh, you know the social what i say the social governance system of china is mainly through Danwei, the units, or through the personnel relationship, formal personnel personnel relationship, because only in that way you can punish and be incentive people to do certain things. If you're just a, a farmer in the rural area and no obvious communist connections, if you need to be Sorry to money. interrupt you one more time. So for, for my audience who may not understand 1980s China, yeah. uh, 1980s China is still very much a uh, very socialist planned economy, yeah. especially yeah. in the cities, yeah. right? I mean, the when you, when you graduate yeah. from college or from, you, when you graduate from college, you are assigned a government job. Everything is kind of planned for and assigned. So so okay. like you, yeah. your that way or your work unit is everything. You, you So you kind of have to comply. Your social security, your medical care, uh, your children go to schools, they take care of everything. So that was the old socialist way of doing things of uh, social governance back to that time. So for the people who live in the urban area and work for the publicly owned units or state owned mm-hmm. units, uh, you know, abide by the one child policy is very important. It's probably one of the, the most important things. So yeah, that's the background. Yeah. If I may so, ask, uh, yeah. uh, if I may ask, yep. uh, can you yeah. can you can you tell like uh, if you if you are willing to share how did your parents meet you know you you mentioned your dad is Han and your mom is Mongol ah cultural revolution <laughs> same, <laughs> same similar with your parents meet so my both of them need to travel very far uh, from their home that they meet in Turpan uh, you know one of uh, the the city famous for its grapes uh, in the southern part of Xinjiang but in the, Right on the, uh, I think, border of uh, southern part of uh, southern Xinjiang, northern. So it's Xinjiang. it's more it's like to the eastern uh, eastern part of Xinjiang. Eastern, Turban, yeah. Turban right. Depression. Yeah. It it's still kind of kind of some people consider it southern Xinjiang because south of the Tianshan Mountains, right? So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. So is that where that's your dad it. is from? Uh, you're right. you're, sorry. Is that where your dad? Did you say that's where your dad is from, or where your mom is? No, from? no, no. My daddy was uh, was enlisted uh, when he was seventeen to join the PLA and sent to Xinjiang. Ah. <laughs> he, he didn't know where he was going. Because back to the early sixties, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was a, a kind of a very bad situation in rural area, mainly because the uh, starvations, uh, the food problems. So uh, you do everything to get out of the rural area to the urban area. Yeah, and, that, that uh, was one of the moment. major wave yeah. of migration to Xinjiang in the it was in the 1960s around the famine right. famine year eras. Yeah, yeah. So so back to that time, uh, three main ways to uh, get out the get out of the rural area and uh, to go to uh, you know better places, the urban area where its food is allocated to you in the socially planned uh, economy. Uh, so one of the ways is uh, to join the army and to be enlisted and to send to other parts of China. And the second way is to become a, a worker, work for the public on the factories, uh, which is, uh, and uh, there's some other ways, but uh, there's two major ways. So my father managed to get the first way to be enlisted and, uh, and he didn't know where he was sent back to say. And when, uh, I, I remember that he told me that after about three or four days in the, in the train, with our windows, you know, that back to the train was for the cargo train. And uh, you have, of course, they got food and they got to, uh, you know, uh, get, get off the train, get off the train uh, from time to time. Uh, 
after about three or four days, it's found that there's no trees outside. It's only sand, just a desert, you know. <laughs> and he was crying back to that time because he wasn't know the was where he was going. Where uh, was he originally back, from? Where was your dad originally from? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, on the border of Shandong and Henan province. It's called Shangqiu. Ah, okay. So it's very yeah. heartland of heartland yeah. of central plains in northern China. Yeah, yeah, in the central parts of China. So uh, when he he was enlisted when he was seventeen, but uh, in order to get uh, you know join the army and get out of the rural area to the urban area, he uh, he reported his uh, age was eighteen. So only in that they can be enlisted. So uh, after uh, serving in the army for a few years, and he was transferred for for some years. He was transferred. Uh, to the uh, local government system, as he works for the uh, transportation and highway management bureau in Xinjiang for many many years until he retired. Uh, so uh, that's one of the most important ways that how I know Xinjiang geographically because uh, I remember that from my uh, primary school, high school, uh, in every summer vacation, he would take me to one of his tours, inspection tours, because he needs to inspect the road construction in Xinjiang. It's very important because Xinjiang is so vast and the train a railway line in Xinjiang was, was very few back to that. So the whole transportation system was mainly road transportation. And Xinjiang's geographic condition is very harsh. We have desert, uh, we have high mountains with snow. So in spring that we flood, uh, there, there are flood. And in the summer, it's very dry, so the road is re- very easy to be uh, you know, destroyed by the na- powers of nature. So he has to uh, you know, drive around with his colleagues and inspect the road transportation system. Every yeah, other I, remember, I remember back when I was growing up in China, I think the train only go up to Urumqi, right? Only goes up to the capital. Uh, I think the yeah, train... Uh, yeah, I mean, um, in 1980s, I, mean, I, 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 I think no, 1980s. I think later they made the train to to the Kazakhstan yeah, yeah. West border, West. and then then much uh, later yeah. they, they built the train to Kashgar. But my, in my memory, yeah. like back back in early 80s, I think the train only goes to Urumqi and a little bit. And that's it. Yeah, 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 and also western world from Urumqi to uh, from Chilapu, which is on the border of uh, Xinjiang and I uh, remember the uh, Kyrgyzstan. And from that time, that's the Oya Dalucha, the intercontinental bridge between uh, uh, Asia and Europe from all the way to, uh, to Western Europe. So I, I think that was completed in the early uh, 1990s, uh, just after the collapse of Soviet Union. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, back to then, the road transport. So, uh, I'm, so, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just, I'm still curious, like, did your dad meet your mom in the army? Yeah, 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 he was. Because, you know, back to that time, my mom was a uh, Mongolian ethnicity, a boy in Tachin, which is uh, uh, on the border of China and Kazakhstan today, but back to then was Soviet Union. And because the cultural revolution is that uh, the middle school study was in, interrupted and uh, we conquered high school. So my mother also, like your mother, uh, was uh, allocated or sent to the rural areas to to support their local construction. Jibian does, Shangshan Xiaxiang, we call it, to go into the mountains and go into the rural areas to support the local development because they are Zhu Shi kind of. Uh, so your, your mom is a Mongol, uh, she comes from a Mongol family on the border, yeah. uh, but she's from the kind of the north, very northwestern tip of Xinjiang, like near yeah, yeah, the border Pachin. between Russia, uh, Kazakhstan and Mongolia, that, that kind of the tri- yeah. little triangle area. Yeah, that that, that was, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think Tatsun, yeah. the Chinese name Tatsun is like a shortened form of its Mongol name, like uh, Tarbatai or something like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're very knowledgeable on that. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that's like the traditional kind of the, 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 the Mongol um, pasture. Uh, back in the days, yeah, yeah. back in the days. Okay. So yeah. So my mother's you're... family actually traced back to the royal Mongolian families, the golden families, back to uh, the Genghis Khan time. Uh, oh wow! And uh, there's a small town. There's a small town just uh, next to Tashin called Urmi, 
I don't know if you've heard about. Erbil、yeah. was actually the capital of one of the major kingdoms、uh, built by、uh, Genghis Khan's、uh, descendants,、uh, Wu Guotai. So it's called in Chinese, it's called Wu Guotai Wang Fu Fen Bi. Its capital is in、uh, in Erbil. It's very big. Uh, oh, that's a, so. That is a headquarter of the Oak Dai, the son of Jeng of yeah, the, yeah, of Genghis Khan. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 um, I, I like Mongol history and all that. I, I'm kind of a history nerd, so I, 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 I knew yeah, I like I knew there、yeah. was a Oak Dai Khanate. There was a like the the、uh, Genghis Khan allotted a piece of land to、yeah. his son Oak Dai, but then Oak Dai became the Great Khan later, so he ruled the whole Mongol、mm-hmm. Empire. But I never figure out exact location of the Oak Dai Khanate, like where his、um, where is his fief, his personal fief. So yeah, that thank you for clearing that up for me. Now I realize it's in northwest Xinjiang. <laughs> I, I just yeah, very few, very few. People know that, so、yeah. I remember、uh, at one time I saw you posted a, a map of Central Asia、uh, throughout history、uh, back in the、uh, 1500s or something,、uh, which clearly marked my mother's hometown,、uh, the early next month. Okay, cool.、Uh-huh. So, so、uh, you I, you can trace descent to Genghis Khan through your mother's side. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> because、uh, Mongols in that area is not many, are not many. Is only a small group of people, so、uh, most of that small group of people can be traced back to that royal family. So my mother was、uh, my mother's member of that family. In fact, so、uh, sure. I, I still remember that my grandmother, my mother's side, can speak fluent Mongolian and Kazakh. She was illiterate. She can't write. She couldn't write, but she can speak their fluent language, both language and Han. So she is trilingual. So、uh, she was such a typical,、uh, you know, Mongol old lady in my memory.、Uh, and she, very elegant, very knowledgeable, and traveling well. So、uh, every time, you know, when we,、uh, when I was little, if we want to buy some fresh land, not that kind of frozen land, you know, we go to the land market where the livestock is sold on markets back in Wanshi, back in Tachun. So every time. We need to remember that bring our granny, you know, bring the grandma because she can communicate. She communicate with the local、uh, shepherds so well. You know, the most famous shepherd back in Xinjiang, not we were. We were good, very good farmers and uh, merchants, uh, but uh, they're not good at uh, you know, uh, you know, doing the farming, doing the livestock farming. The most famous her shepherd back in Xinjiang was Kazakh. They produce the highest quality of beans, land, and so on. So,、uh, because my grandmother can speak very fluent Kazakh, so every time we got premium beef and lamb with the lowest price. <laughs> so,、nice. uh, she she was really good bargainer. I, I would like to say, yeah. So it's,、uh, almost. That's、yeah. a good point because n- not many people realize that Xinjiang, especially northern Xinjiang, is a very diverse place. It's very,、uh, mul- yeah. it's multi-ethnic and very diverse. Because like people think talk about Xinjiang, they just associate it either with Han or Uyghurs. They didn't realize there's still like forty other ethnic groups from Xinjiang.、Yeah. Uh, you know, like Mongols, Kazakh, Kyrgyz,、uh, Tatar, Russian. Taji yeah, yeah. and Hui, 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 and Hui Muslim as well. So, like, it's、yeah. like even even in China, I mean, that's not just like in the West. Like the, in the West, the, the knowledge about Xinjiang is like zero. So they just believe whatever the mainstream media tells them, and, and they they just know、Excellent. Xinjiang as or like the the just, just they just know Xinjiang and Uyghur, right? But even in China itself, in like inland China, a lot of people just associate Xinjiang with maybe Uyghur. They they don't they, they don't even And realize there's like tons of ethnic groups in Xinjiang. Like the Mongols have been in Xinjiang since you know before the time of Genghis Khan, right? Yeah, for at least eight hundred years. Yes,、yeah. that's true. So I agree with you. That's a very good point. That、um, Xinjiang was a, a very special place that not many people, you know, know very well. Even for Chinese, for every Chinese,、uh, for example, when I went to Beijing. When I came to Beijing、uh, back when I was eighteen for college, many people ask me that. Wow, you're from Xinjiang, so you must be Uyghurs. There are twenty. Come on, there's twenty plus more ethnic groups in Xinjiang. 
And we were, of course, there, there has the largest population, but there's many other more ethnic groups which are native, to, uh, they lived for centuries uh, in Xinjiang. So it's, it's a very diverse fight in terms of ethnicity and population and religious. So it's, it's not, Xinjiang has not belongs to a single population or a single religion. That's, I think that's the uh, very shallow understanding of Xinjiang. If you so um, yeah, back to my uh, mother family story. It's so interesting. Uh, so basically uh, from my grandma's, from my mother's, uh, you know, grandma on my mother's side, because she's a very knowledgeable and very smart Mongol lady, she insisted to send her children to high schools instead of from the Mongol uh, ethnic schools. Because in Xinjiang, there's a, after the 1949, there's two education systems. There's an ethnic, ethnic education system, there's a Han education system. So basically, uh, because the constitution and the local law uh, confirms the rights of receiving education in your own language with your ethnic people. So you have to do this two system of uh, education, one in Han, Mandarin education, one in your uh, ethnic. So uh, let, let's say emphasize, and I just want to emphasize that for a second, especially yeah. for my American audience, because, <laughs> because uh, you know, I know Americans might think of the two separate schools in, oh my God, that's segregation. Uh, yeah, I know, segregation. Right? And so that's why I need to, so now this is, um, this is this was created after the creation of People's Republic of China because the that. the ethnic policy of PRC is that in the autonomous regions like Xinjiang is Uyghur yeah. autonomous region. So, the five, yeah. So in Xinjiang, by law, the the, the yeah. local uh, ethnicity will be entitled to educate, be educated in their own language. Well, so, yeah. So that is why there's a Uyghur only school, but but people have a choice, right? They can choose whether they go to the Uyghur school or the Han school, right? Exactly. I think you have touched one of the central problems here, in China, which I I mean to develop a little bit later. Uh, these two are uh, systems of education, which is completely different. On the opposite side, on the opposite side of segregation, means that you have the rights to choose which system do you go to? So um, uh, from kindergarten, uh, primary school, all the way to high school back in Xinjiang, I, because I went to uh, high school uh, after my mother, because my mother also went to high school. And, and when we say high school, we're actually just talking about Mandarin education school, right? Because Mandarin, like, it's, it's not a school for Han people. It's a, it's a school no, no, where no. the language, educational it's only language. Yeah, the, the yeah. medium, educational medium is in Mandarin Chinese. Yeah. Okay, Mandarin. Let's, let's get that out of there. Not for <laughs> Han only or ethnic group only. Yeah. No. It, it's not, it's not can... like if you're Uyghur, you can only go to the Uyghur school. No, it's like the Uyghur school are taught in. In Uyghur language, the the the, yeah. the so what what we call the Han school are the Mandarin uh, lang uh, Mandarin language as an educational medium schools, but people can choose exactly. which like the Uyghur can go to the Han school <laughs> and yeah. the Han can so, go to Uyghur school if they want, but like it's completely yes yeah. yes uh, it's permitted by law and it's your rights to choose which language uh, which language are you uh, of education are you receiving. So, but the uh, practitioner, uh, but the uh, practical problem is that uh, if you are Han, if you want to go to ethnic schools, you have to learn ethnic language, which is uh, you know, very difficult for them. So uh, I think most of the time, Han people just go to Han schools. And another reason is about socioeconomic empowerment, reason, because if you are to Han schools and you means that you are going to a higher education system, uh, which is, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, China higher education, Chinese higher education system is open for you. Because if you are only, because if you are ethnic minorities um, to, who study in ethnic minority language, that means that you have to take the local uh, university intake exam. That means that many Chinese universities, the top universities like Tsinghua, Beida, and Fudan, are not open for you because they can't provide this uh, ethnic minority language courses for you. 
I so, remember. Yeah. So I remember there was a. I watched a documentary from Xinjiang called uh, "I Come from Xinjiang." I come from Xinjiang. This is a this is a documentary uh, made by a Uyghur uh, film uh, documentary maker about different people from Xinjiang. And I what stuck out to me is one scene where they interview these uh, Uyghur couples working in a Uyghur restaurant in Beijing, and the right. the man. Uh, the young man said he graduated from college uh, in Xinjiang, uh, but it's obvious he, he couldn't speak Mandarin, right? So he mm. uh, he went through the whole Uyghur education system from from kindergarten to college, only be educated in Uyghur. And he one thing he he talked about on the show was um, when he was interviewed, he was speaking Uyghur. He said, you know, he had a lot of problem um, integrating in Beijing because Beijing obviously is a Mandarin speaking environment and he didn't have the Mandarin skills. So like only option for him, even though he was college educated in back in Xinjiang in the Uyghur college, uh, in Beijing, his only kind of job opportunity was working the Uyghur restaurant. Right, that's true, and that's very sad for them. Uh, I I feel that uh, same way because uh, uh, you, you're right. If you're only receiving uh, as the minority language education, for example, most of the as most of the river, your job option, job uh, hunting opportunity are very limited if you're not in Xinjiang. So I think that's one of the things that the Chinese government. Uh, tries to empower them by, uh, you know, by trying to provide uh, as many uh, higher education opportunities to them as possible. But back to the 80s and 90s, when I, uh, when I was growing, there wasn't so, so many opportunities back then because that Xinjiang was relatively underdeveloped compared to, to the coastal area. So the education, so the resources uh, for the education are also limited. So we can only stick to our traditional system of Han, uh, Mandarin education and ethnic minority language education. So that's one of the reasons. I, I also want to interject just for a second. There is a, actually a vast difference in educational resources within China. Like if you're from Beijing or Shanghai, you get the best educational resources. Uh, but if you're from like a, 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 a second tier or third tier city, or if you're from a rural countryside, your education resources is a lot limited. And, and if you're from Xinjiang, of course, then, then it's like a, you're like off the chart. You just fall off the chart, right? So there's like kind of almost a hierarchical system. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I'm from, uh, you know, I was born in a big city in Chongqing, but still even Chongqing compared to um, Beijing and Shanghai, it's not it's not the same. You know, Beijing and Shanghai is up here. Chongqing is maybe like down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah third tier. So back then, Chongqing is maybe third tier city. <laughs> back in the eighties, yeah, yeah. Good, good. yeah, you're absolutely uh, right on that. So the education resources uh, allocation was always a problem uh, when I was uh, you know back in the eighties and nineties. So the opportunities for the ethnic minority people to receive Mandarin education wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't very good back to that. So, um, yeah, let's get back to my uh, grandma. So uh, she insists that uh, her children should go to high school to receive uh, Mandarin education because uh, he knows that her children can access to a bigger market, whether it's a job market or, you know, Merchant, merchant oh, so, so your grandma sent your mother to Han, Han school? She sent all her children to Han school. Mm. So, so, so thanks to my uh, grandmother and my mother's said, you know, so uh, my mother's family actually, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, very good uh, later when they developed. And my cousins are receiving, or most of them receiving higher education. They work in the urban area. And so uh, I think, I think, so let me ask you at this point, uh, you know, for your Han educated, the Mongol yeah. side of the family, did they face any kind of discrimination uh, growing up in Xinjiang? Not, I can remember of actually, because uh, we don't, the, the discrimination we understand in China is, um, for example, on two folds. For, first, you look differently. And people are not taking you as their, you know, as their pals. 
I mean, for Mongol, this issue is not very obvious because、uh, all the Han Chinese are actually Mongolian ethnicity, you know, in in terms of anthropology. So because I mean, we look the same, we 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 look the there's there's like a not、uh, Mongols are not a, like a visible minority as we say in yeah, United yeah, States. It's true, yeah, it's true. It's it's so like the the difference may be、uh, in like the language and 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 but but language if、yeah. you are educated already in Mandarin Chinese that kind of remove that additional barrier, I guess.、Mm, yeah. That's right, and the second barrier is about the language. If you don't speak the common language, and there are some opportunities you cannot access to, there are some you know, th- some resources you cannot access to. I think that's the hard truth. So,、uh, from、uh, my mother, from my mother's generation, we don't have those two issues anymore, because my grandma's wise decision of proactively、uh, in- integrated our family into the Han education system and into the Mandarin education system. So、uh, I think that's the reason we can enjoy all the ethnic minority groups'、uh, benefits provided by the government too. So,、um, so my mother actually uh, uh, went from Taichung. Let's come back to Taichung and to Turpan as a as a, as a、uh, 上山下乡就是青年 because she、uh, just finished her middle school back to Zion. So that's where she met my father. So、she was an educated、yeah. youth sent down to the countryside. <laughs> well, down to the countryside. I, this is for my English English speaking audience. <laughs> I'm just translating.、Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah.、Um, back to the back to that time in the early late sixties and early seventies. I think you're probably aware of that. Most of the Chinese girls,、uh, no matter of ethnicities, I, I think、uh, most of ethnicities,、uh, their dreams are married to. Uh, State-owned factory workers.、Uh, what is even better is to marry to a PLA, you know, soldier or officer. Because、uh, back to the socialist the planned economy, that was <laughs> that was the jobs that was guaranteed the resources, you know, allocated to the households. So that was the. It's a very, the, very, the, it's a very、yeah. practical choice, but also very back in、choice. back in the Cultural Revolution era, PLA also has a lot of command of very high prestige. Like it's not just、yeah. monetary, it's not just a material con- condition, but also、uh, PLA、social、has a, like a very high social standing. Like you, it, it's like if you're from a soldier family, if you're part PLA, like people up, look up to you as well as all the associated benefits. And and a full disclaimer: my mom's first boyfriend <laughs> is a PLA、yeah. soldier, but but she was he was、um, he so during Cultural Revolution. Uh, you know, during that time, they the 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 army has to approve your marriage. So、uh, like,、yeah. she and her boyfriend they send a pro like、uh, they send in the request for getting married, but that was、uh, rejected because、uh, her boyfriend was、uh, was on her boyfriend was on the track to be promoted to be an officer to be like she he was on the track of going places, but my mom was from.、Um, Because my my grandpa on my my mother's side, he has some K N T association from back in the day. So, so my mom was like the bad class element, you know, because her family background. So the army didn't approve. Yeah, yeah. You know, he he's a hey <laughs> lay my the 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 the, the black five、uh, five element. So my so the army rejected their their marriage、uh, request, and that's how. I my mom then met, met my dad. That's how I come from. So, so well, thank you. Well, lucky for、PLA. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, that was the. I think that was the characteristic、uh, of that time. You know, yeah,、uh, yeah, around cultural revolution of how、uh, you know people are seeking their spouse. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, based on some very practical reasons. Yeah.、Um, Right. That's that's that answers to your, your questions as per the meet the meeting、uh, the match in Turpin. Did your mom speak?、Uh, do your mom still?、Uh, do your mom speak speak Mongolian?、Uh, she can.、Uh, she can understand Mongolian、mm-hmm. most of the time, but she can't speak very well because、mm-hmm. uh, uh, if you go to high school and to、yeah. receive education in high school, you only speak to your mother and father from time to time Mongolian, and you don't tend to use the Mongolian. 
That's that's kind of so, like the that's actually kind of like a lot of the Chinese American family I know in United States. The the kids they understand Chinese when they're being spoken to by their parents, but yeah, because the, because yeah. their ways are socialized in school, they speak only English. So when they come back, yeah. the parents will speak to them in Chinese, <laughs> but they will respond in English. So yeah, that, that's that's very common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I found it's very similar with the second second generation of immigrations, uh, yeah. Chinese immigrations in the West. When I was uh, studying and working overseas, so um, yeah, that's where they meet in Terpen, and then uh, uh, they move to Ramchi, and uh, my sister was born in Terpen, Terpen, and I was born in Ramchi. That's so. That's how. This family is made of. And oh, so you 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 have an older sister. Your your sister is older than. I had an older sister. Oh, so I'm you're the like second child. Okay, yeah, you're like me, and second then, child. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. my yeah. uh, so you you basically travel when you're growing up. You basically travel all over Xinjiang. You know, you or or your family did from you know, especially your mom from Tatan all the way on the border from Kazakhstan <laughs> to Turpan, all the way on the eastern part of Xinjiang, and then they yeah. settle in Urumqi, which is in the center of Xinjiang. Okay, wow. Yeah, north. Yeah, on the north center of Xinjiang, exactly. So that's the basically the story of uh, uh, of my of my family. And uh, there are some other things. Interesting thing is, uh, you know, my my mother's family was not only made of Mongolian ethnicity; it was also Kazakh and Russian. So it's a very mixed family. So my mom's uncle uh, is actually Kazakh, uh, and she married a Kazakh woman, and uh, their their kids are all Kazakh ethnicities. And one thing particularly interesting about the, my mother's uncle was that they, <laughs> they defected to the Soviet Union back in the 60s. <laughs> that ah, was a yes, very yes. So this was uh, for the people of, uh, who are not yeah. familiar with this part of Chinese history. Yeah. So after the site, so Soviet Union used to have a, like a large influence on Xinjiang up to the point of the Sino-Soviet split, right? So after yeah. the Sino-Soviet split, the relationship broke up. And then uh, this was also, also around the time in 19, early 1960s when uh, Soviet Union, uh, under Khrushchev, uh, Soviet Union yeah. was trying to develop Central Asia. They're trying to invite a lot of settlers to what they call the virgin lands in Kazakhstan to, to, yeah. to farm. And, and one of the solutions they, they found was... Uh, the Soviet consulate in uh, Yinin or Kuja started to Actually, hand out passport to yeah. <laughs> to whoever come asking. Like uh, this is this is in China in Xinjiang, the Soviet consulate in Xinjiang was handing out freely handing out Soviet passport to anybody yeah. who want one. So uh, yeah, yeah. that then in 1960s too, I think that. Uh, it, it became known as the Yinin incident when like 60,000, more than 60,000 people more than from, 60, yeah. from, from the Yili Valley, they were all went across the border to, yeah. to Kazakhstan. So your, your uncle was one of the, one of the way. My whole, my uncle's family was one of them. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we called, uh, that was, I think that was in 1963, we called it Ita Shijian, where uh, the incident of uh, Yili and Tachin where uh, more than 60, yeah, 60 thousands of uh, uh, peoples live on the border of China and the USSR actually went over to USSR, become USSR citizen. And back to that time, in the early 60s, uh, was the honeymoon time between China and Soviet Union. Uh, the border was practically, uh, no one can choose the border. So the people on the border from both sides can just uh, cross the border freely. And after the 1962 uh, uh, incident, the border was closed. And, uh, I remember. I remember a lot of reading a lot of memoirs about you know the the time of Sino-Soviet split. That before yeah. in 1950s and before the Sino-Soviet split, the whole frontier, whole from northern frontier with Mongolia, with Soviet Union, it's all unguarded. You know, like they talk about fishermen on the Amur River on Heilongjiang, they would just freely cross over to fish and the, yeah. the Russian, they, sometimes they meet the Russian patrol and they, they wave at them. And the, But that, yeah. that, that all changed after the Sino-Soviet split, yeah. Yeah, after 1962, that's true. And yeah, and that's the story of my mother's uncle. 
And, and this is your of, this is your so th- your this is your mother's uncle. So he's Mong he's a Mongol that married a Kazakh woman, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. No, he, no, my my uncle was half Mongol and half Kazakh himself. I think. Oh, oh, he's yeah. half Kazakh, half Mongol. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the people don't she, real people don't realize how diverse and how oh, intercultural, yeah. multicultural crazy. the area yeah. of Tatsun and Yinin are. Like this is the area of northwestern Xinjiang. Uh, you know the 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 traditionally calls three district. That so, so the. The, the, the Yinin is in the Yili Valley and Tatsun is a little bit in the north. So yeah, that whole... Uh, oh, okay. yeah. Atai is the northernmost point. Oh, yeah. right. So Atai, so, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the Altai, the Tatsun, and, um, and, and, and Yili, Yili. They're, they're the three, three districts. The three three north, and they're like right on the border with former Soviet Union and Mongolia. And th- that area has a lot of influence from like Russia and the Soviet Union. And there was a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of mixtures on, on this border. I, I, I remember reading about that, but you, your personal story just kind of fleshed out the, all the details. So thank you for that. That really happens to my family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, when I heard this story, it's oh, wow. This could be a TV series or drama or drama or something. <laughs> yeah, but that's the new story happened to my family. So my mother uh, told me when I was young that uh, they, they knew nothing. They lived not far from with each other, me and my mother's family and her uncle's family. Not far from each other, on the same street. But almost over one night, something they disappeared. And no one knows where they did they go. So they just guessed that they might cross the border with the help of KGB and uh, the Soviet consulate in Tachin and become a Soviet Union citizen. And they, since then, they lost contact with each other for almost 40 years until 1992, after the collapse of Soviet Union. Suddenly, one day, uh, my mom and my uncle, my mom's uh, younger brother, received a letter or a phone call, I can't remember, from, uh, uh, from Almaty, the capital of Kazakhstan back then, and says that we have uh, we have found their uncle wow. after four years. Uh, we have already grown into a very big family, and their children's married to Kazakh, Russians, and uh, uh, different ethnicities. And uh, last time I saw my uh, mother's uncle's family, he's uh, he already passed away. Uh, but uh, he has about three sons and two daughters and something, and they have their kids, so very big families. So four of my uh, cousins, they're all females, came over to visit us uh, back to 2004, I think. That was quite an experience because the four girls all look differently. One blonde, one black hair, one red <laughs> <laughs> and I can't even remember the, the last one. It's, it's brown hair, I think. It's brown hair girl. So they're all my cousins. And they only speak Russian and a little English and a little Kazakh. So we can only communicate with each other with English. And, you know, so I, I, I guess I never had the opportunity to ask my uncle whether we regret the decision of uh, mm. defected to Soviet <laughs> Union back to the 60s. But I guess we never thought the Soviet Union would collapse, the former Soviet Union would collapse in the early, early 1990s. So, yeah, that was the, was the history of my thing. Yeah, no, nobody expected the Soviet Union would collapse, not even the CIA. CIA didn't know the <laughs> Soviet Union would collapse. Um, wow, I mean, that, that is a quite story. I mean, like, but the, that, that's that whole story of Xinjiang. Uh, you know, kind of being the crossroad and the multicultural melting pot that that goes all the way back. Uh, I mean, like there was a, a back in the 16th, 17th century, there was a, the, the Mongol uh, 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 Torhut tribe that came mm. came back all the Probably, way from yeah. Volga River, right from Russia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back to Xinjiang. Yeah. yeah. Did, do you do you happen to know your grandma's uh, tribal association? Like which uh, which Mongol um, Mongol tribe? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to ask my uh, my mother's okay, family okay. uh, if they have if they know any aware of that. But I'm sure it's not connected to the the, the part you talk about the Tohut because they moved back from uh, from you know the Russian 
part of the Central Asia back to back to Xinjiang. But my yeah. mother's family has been, you know, uh, living and touching around that area for centuries. Yeah. So uh, I guess there's different branches of the of the Mongol families. So anyway, so that's the that's the my story of my mother's uncle, and for my mother and. She always told me that uh, when she was young, after the 1962 incident, there was an even serious, even more serious incident in 1969, which a whole, uh, a, a whole uh, uh, platoon of PLA uh, border, tro- border patrol was ambushed by the Soviet army, by the Soviet Red Army, not far from Tashi. We call it the incident, Terekoti uh, incident. Uh, the, it's, it's mainly a uh, 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 retaliation on the PLA's action in the Dongbei, in the north, uh, northeastern of China, in Zhenbaodao, the treasure island. Because the treasure island, the PLA got upper hand, and they even captured a t- to, uh, 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 the most advanced uh, Soviet tanks by that time. So I T-62. think it was a T-72, maybe? Like the T-62. 62. Oh, yeah, T-62 62. tank was captured by the PLA. PLA. So this yeah, is yeah. Uh, what the, the, the what Chinese called the Zimbabwe was uh, called uh, known by Russian as a Damansky Damansky Island. Yeah, yeah. And this was a yeah. 1969 uh, incident where, um, like, even even U- U.S. even the Western press were aware of it because it's it's like a very major military confrontation between China and yeah. Soviet Union on the on the Amur River. Along the Amur, Amur River. River, yeah, and and yeah. and so 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 Soviet wanted a payback for yeah for that, so they staged an incident right near Xinjiang on the other side of the China Soviet border, yeah. and and this is the incident you're talking about. Yeah, uh, because the the incident happened is very close to my mother's hometown, uh, so she remembers that after that incident because she was in middle school. The school basically shut down and nobody taught lessons or, or studying. The things they do all day is just digging bunkers and underground tunnels to, pay, to prepare for nuclear warfare exchange, to, to prepare for a total war with Soviet Union. So I think she did that for months. <laughs> I think that that's was, uh, that was her childhood. I'm really sometimes really sorry for her, but that was the situation back then she got faces. Uh, the superpowers you know, with nuclear powers. It, it, it wasn't. It so, wasn't just uh, your mom because I live in Chongqing. That's as far from the Soviet border Shenzhen, as possible. The third frontier. Yeah. Yeah, but, but still, back then. Yeah, yeah, back then in, in in Cultural Revolution, they dug tunnels underneath the mountains of Chongqing. Like now, you can go to Chongqing. There's like all kind of underground tunnels. Like they build like yeah, yeah. shopping malls in in those underground tunnels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, like, but yeah, that, yeah. That, that was also yeah. to prepare for the possible war between China and Soviet Union, and that that that's was right. because Chongqing was maybe like as you said the third the third front that that's going to be the, the last the resort third. if it's the Soviet Union that's occupy right. the northern China, you know. The <laughs> so, we were at first front. We were at first front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you guys are like right up there. You you, you guys are right the. You, you, you'll be the meeting yeah. the first wave of the Red Army coming over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, my mother and her, her, her classmates will be run over by Soviet tanks in five minutes after global cows or something like that. Yeah, I also remember, well, yeah. you weren't born back then, but like in 1979, during the uh, in the Chi- China Vietnamese, uh, uh, China Vietnamese border Part, war in yeah, 1979, Part, I remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, China put on all the northern frontier with Soviet Union on high alert. Like there were like uh, three hundred thousand people were evacuated um, from the frontier. Uh, yeah. I, 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 you 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 weren't born yet, so you you might not know, but your mom might know about that. Yeah, yeah. Back to then, they already I think they they already in Guangxi, but yes, because uh, the Vietnam. The, uh, Chinese government was a uh, military was a freedom fight that the Soviet Union might be take advantage from the north side when uh, the PLA engaged with the Vietnam army on the, on the south side. So yeah, that was, that was the time. So Xinjiang was uh, facing very, uh, I would say very um, serious geopolitical situation multiple times in history. So uh, if you ask me, well, 
well, today, how do you think today's Western, you know, propaganda and Western, you know, uh, things on Xinjiang about the genocide concentration camps? I think, well, personally, I think that it's nothing compared to what my mother experienced back to that time, the Soviet tanks, you know, about 200 meters away from you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's only a Yeah, I, that, I mean, so. I, let's ju I just put it out there. There's no genocide in Xinjiang. Okay, yeah. that's, that's, that's all bullshit. And if anybody who is aware of the Xinjiang history, you know, I, I'm a history nerd, so I read about the Xinjiang history from... 17th from the 17th century all the way up to the present and what i can say is you know no matter what you think the prc policy in xinjiang is after 1949 um especially after 1976 and after the end of cultural revolution xinjiang has never enjoyed more uh you know, Xinjiang has never been more at peace <laughs> and stable because because back in whole, the whole early 20th century of Xinjiang is just civil war, like nonstop civil war in 1930s, 1940s. I mean, like like there, there were massacres, there, there were massive death, starvation. So so right now in Xinjiang is actually the best time in the last couple hundred years, I would say. Socioeconomically, yes, I agree with you. So, um, yeah, uh, that was the, uh, so that, that's why I, I think it's nothing compared to what my mother experience because they uh, feel the intimidation of the real nuclear war, but now it's just a propaganda and fake news and disinformation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, sure. Uh, that, so that's the story of my life. So um, talking about myself, so uh, after I was born, the second child of my family, Thanks to the ethnic minority policies that were immune from the one child policy myself. So, um, another thing is that life changing experiences at uh, Gaokao, the uh, University of Utah. Because uh, I also went to this school. As so, so but before, before you start talking about the college yeah. interest exam, um, so you have a choice, right? Like when, you, when your dad, your parents register you on your uh, I you know, they, they have a choice to register you either as Han or Mongol, right? Yes, as long as uh, your parents actually are Han or Mongol, so yeah. children can choose either. So why not choose Mongol? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, that's why I'm uh, registered as a Mongol. So let me, I, I, I want to, so we, we have some yeah. uh, little bit technical issue because like for some, like yeah, yeah. your song is coming through not very, uh, like it's a very low volume, but I, I'm gonna uh, 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 put a personal anecdote also about the, about the uh, Chinese affirmative action uh, and, and, the, uh, and the ethnic policy. So my, uh, growing up in Chongqing, we don't have a lot of minorities. <laughs> like, you know, so, so Chongqing, Chongqing is like 99% Han Chinese. Um, so I, I was not even aware there was like uh, ethnic minority in my school until, um, so what, one of my best friend turned out to be a Hui Muslim, but I didn't know, I didn't know he's a Hui Muslim until... Until the, yeah, until the, uh, um, because not only there's college interest exam, but there's also exam for uh, from elementary school to junior high and from junior high to high school. So uh, during the exam from elementary school to junior high, his brother, his older brother, um, uh, his older brother is in the same class as my, my sister. Uh, and so she, she, yeah, he, people find out he put on Hui, you know, Hui Muslim on, on his uh, on his floor, so he can get the extra extra uh, bonus point on his uh, on his exam. And people at the time, people thought it was oh, it's so unfair. But uh, his brother is actually one of the you know the he's among the top five student in his class. Um, but I guess the difference is is, is like like being top five he was guaranteed get into like any uh, high school that's maybe the second rank. Like at the time, the Chongqing, uh, uh, during our district, Satinba district in Chongqing, the, the best two schools is uh, the, the Yizong and Sanzong, the number one and number three uh, schools or the uh, high schools were the best. And then the uh, Qizong is, is 
it's kind of maybe a little bit less, right? The, the number seven, number seven school is a little bit less. So he has no problem like being number uh, like on top five of his class. He has no problem getting into you know number seven junior high. <laughs> like, but but that extra you know whatever extra points he get from Hui Mus, uh, being Hui Muslim just guarantee him a spot at the top you know, like a top school. So, so yeah, I remember that. And I, that I should have realized like, cause he, he was younger. My, my friend is younger than me. And I did not have anybody in my class that had a sibling, right? Like, why did he have an older brother? I mean, that should have clued me in. Like he, his family is ethnic minority, but I, it didn't connect to me at the time. But yeah, he, he was a Hui Muslim. And, uh, but his dad, so his 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 um his grandparents uh were from Yunnan, right? Like very traditional, uh, a very traditional Muslim um area. But but his dad was uh, very secular, like because this is like nineteen eighties, right? It's a very secular time. So his dad was <laughs> like we don't didn't realize his dad is Muslim because his dad is like every living like everybody else. He didn't pray. He didn't. He didn't like you know go to a mosque. He didn't so so nobody knows. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. So like so like only, we only find out when his son filling a form in the in the uh, application to junior high. Yeah, that that was right. my anecdote. Yeah, that's story. one. Yeah, that's when you find the ethnic minority guys around you, you know, <laughs> like filling the forms and get yeah. the points. That's true. That's happened to me. So basically, I, you know. That concludes the part one of my interview with Gordon Gao, a direct descendant of Genghis Khan, an ethnic Mongol born and raised in Xinjiang. He will, in part two, we will discuss his life story growing up in Xinjiang, going through the Chinese system, uh, as well as some of the terrorism incident in Xinjiang that he, he and his family experienced firsthand. I spent a lot of effort putting together these episodes, and I do appreciate your support. Uh, to support the Silk and Steel podcast, go to patreon.com. Uh, search Silk. The Silk and Steel podcast should be the first in the result. I hope you enjoy listening and I hope you subscribe. Bye-bye.